all across America and around the world. This is Veterans Radio. This is Veterans Radio. Welcome to Veterans Radio. I am Jim Fossone. I'm the officer of the deck today. We've got some great programs for you. I think you'll find very interesting. We always want to remind you, you can find more about Veterans Radio at its Facebook site or by going to veteransradio.net where we're on the web 24-7. You can find a lot of our podcasts there as well. We post new ones every Tuesday, so you can get a new story, a new interview, something you didn't know before by going to veteransradio.net. And before we get started, we want to thank our sponsors. First up, we want to thank National Veteran Business Development Council, nvbdc.org. It was established to certify both service-disabled and veteran-owned businesses. You'll find out how they can help your business by going to nvbdc.org. We also want to thank Eisenhower Center. It's a brain injury recovery center. Learn more about eisenhowercenter.com. They're located in Michigan and in Florida. We want to thank Legal Help for Veterans. Legal Help for Veterans fights for veterans' disability rights all across the nation. You can reach them at 800-693-4800 or on the web at legalhelpforveterans.com. Contact us if you'd like to be a sponsor on Veterans Radio, and let's move on to our program. We want to welcome to Veterans Radio today, Dr. Samuel Kalush. Dr. Kalush uh, spent a little time in the Army back uh, back in the day, uh, in, in the Vietnam era, was a captain. Uh, let me set this up a little bit. He's a good uh, Detroit area boy. I think he went to University of Detroit uh, High School. Uh, he graduated from U of M, uh, University of Michigan Medical School in 1966. You interned at Milwaukee County General in 1966-1967. And then Uncle Sam came calling, and you served in Vietnam as a battalion surgeon with the uh, 128th uh, 1st Infantry Division. And then from uh, August 1967 to the April 1968, I should say, that's when you served. And then uh, you served as a staff surgeon in the 98th EVAC Hospital in Da Nang, from May of 1968 to July of 1968. Uh, Dr. Kalush then returned to the United States, uh, was at Fort Bragg to finish out his tour at Womack Army Hospital through 1969, Uh, went on to train in general surgery, followed by heart surgery, Uh, was in private practice in heart surgery in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and Saginaw, Michigan until the early 90s, uh, got smart, moved south to nicer weather in Sarasota, Florida, and uh, continued on helping out as a cardiologist until uh, uh, 2020. Uh, So you've had a long and distinguished career in medicine. Uh, I want to bring you all the way back, Dr. Kalush, to uh, when you had those captain bars on. You ready for that? I'm ready, shoot. (laughs) So why don't you tell us how a nice doctor like you got uh, pulled in to be a battalion surgeon? Well, as you mentioned in the the introduction there, which was very nice, thank you very much, I got a draft notice in the spring of 1967, uh, as most of my uh, classmates did that were in this intern class in Milwaukee, And I was ordered to report to Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio for boot camp for doctors. That was a a one-month boot camp. And that went by pretty quickly, and uh, they gave us uh, a few bucks and some uniforms and put us on a plane, a commercial flight, over to Vietnam. And uh, I landed in Vietnam and basically uh, jumped on a helicopter and they took me out to my assigned unit, the 1st to the 28th with the 1st Infantry Division. And I was a uh, captain and I was the medical officer for the battalion with a squad of medics. And from there... We carried out our various uh, missions. And back, uh, let's remind folks, because we have so many people who are listening to Veteran Radio here, uh, Dr. Kalush, that 
it was common, and in fact, I don't know if any doctor didn't go through this process. They didn't, may not have ended up in Vietnam, but Uncle Sam was grabbing doctors left and right, wasn't he? Yes, in 1967, as I remember, every uh, every one of my peers in my internship class, in my medical school class, had an obligation with the federal government, most of which was being drafted into the military service in one branch or another. So it was a very, very active time for the draft, and particularly for the draft of uh, physicians, because they just uh, they were building up so rapidly uh, in Vietnam that they, they needed the manpower. And really, medicine was so much different back then than it was today in terms of what was done in the battlefield, what could be done in the battlefield. So, you know, every, as I say, every doctor of that vintage went through this process, um, you know, uh, whether, they, whether they wanted to or not. Uh, so your, your experience was shared by a whole lot of guys, I suspect. Yes, and it was all new experiences. Uh, I've heard that uh, in a war, you have to relearn the lessons that people learned in the previous war, and that was certainly true. I had never uh, been exposed to the trauma that I was about to see in Vietnam, nor the uh, civilian illnesses that we saw over in the subtropical region. So it was uh, a learning experience as well as service. So talk to us a little bit about... um uh, Sam, about the what what the role of the battle uh, battalion surgeon was uh, at that point in time. Well, I had the immediate uh, responsibility of looking after the uh, the health needs of the battalion, along with my squad of medics. Uh, generally speaking, we had the squad of medics, uh, which were uh, to support the morale of the enlisted men. And you had the doctor in the units to support the morale of the officers. But beyond that, uh, we had a sick call every day because uh, with several hundred people in the battalion, we had the usual and variety of illnesses that come up in any large group of people. And, uh, of course, we had the, uh, the wounds from war that we uh, uh, had to take care of. and. Uh, provide a lot of first aid. We had to concentrate on evacuation of uh, personnel that were seriously ill or seriously wounded. Uh, That was part of our duty. And if we had civilians or enemy troops, uh, we provided care for them as well. We really didn't uh, distinguish too much in terms of uh, how we took care of people. If they brought us a patient, uh, that was ill, we uh, diagnose, treat the patient, and uh, either keep him in the field, or as I mentioned, if he was seriously ill, we'd evacuate him to a rear medical station. So a lot of this was sophisticated first aid, but sometimes uh, we actually had to do some fairly aggressive surgical procedures in the field if it was a life-saving situation. Well, that's part of how medicine has really changed over time is what you actually could do in the field or shouldn't do in the field. But let me back yeah. you up. How many doctors would have been in the uh, in the squad that you were working with? How many medics would you have had? Help us understand the size. You had a couple hundred people you were responsible for um, in, in terms of the battalion. But uh, what's the size of the medical team? Well, we had, uh, for this battalion of about anywhere from four to 600 soldiers, we had the one doctor, myself, and I had seven or eight medics with me. Uh, and uh, that was our medical staff for the medical needs of the, uh, the medical and the surgical needs of the battalion. And you mentioned that uh, there was, you know, you would, you would serve the, the indigenous population, uh, the civilian population, but I also suspect the the, uh, the Americans also came up with a lot of unusual diseases, tropical diseases that you just don't see in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Well, that's very true. One of the most common illnesses we saw was malaria. Uh, we picked up a lot of malaria over in Vietnam. Part of that was due to the fact that the enemy troops, particularly the North Vietnamese that came into country to do their fighting, they brought 
the malaria with them, and uh, they infected the mosquitoes, who then would come over and, and infect our troops. So we had to learn to recognize a malaria. And if we recognize it, then we evacuated that individual, because that's not something I could really take care of in the field. And were there also uh, nurses in the in the medical team here, or was it just uh, the the one doctor and the seven or eight medics? It was just the doctor and the seven or eight medics. Uh, it was it, everything was all male. There were no females in the battalion at all, and the nurses w- uh, worked at the rear aid uh, aid stations and hospitals. This wasn't the sort of uh, uh, assignment or detail that kept you uh, safely behind the wire, as they like to say today, or in the green zone. Uh, Talk to us a little bit about what living conditions were like and what uh, those uh, experiences that you had as a battalion surgeon. Well, uh, we spent so much time in the field on our sweeps, on our so-called search and destroy missions, And there was really no safe space Uh, once we were out in the jungle. uh, We would conduct our sweeps and, of course, always fearful of snipers or an ambush. And then we would construct what we called a night defensive position. It was really an overnight camp. And we put up a security uh, circle of troops who, who stood guard. But... When we did come under attack, uh, there was really no safe space to go to. Uh, Everybody was vulnerable. They put us in the middle uh, of things and brought the wounded to us uh, in in the middle of our encampment. And we just kind of hoped we could get some uh, treatment going, clear a spot for the helicopter to come in, and uh, depend on the soldiers to prevent the enemy from overrunning the camp. You're a brand new Uh, doctor. You're a brand new, you know, captain. Uh, This is not an experience you've ever had. What was the first firefight like for you? Well, the first firefight, uh, we were uh, actually camped out at an airstrip. And we had conducted a sweep uh, in the area a little bit northwest of Saigon. So it was kind of a remote uh, airfield. Uh, we got first wind that there could be trouble when there were uh, uh, journalists and photographers that showed up. And they generally only showed up if there was a pretty good chance that we were going to encounter the enemy. And that night, the enemy attacked us. And we came under heavy uh, uh, fire from artillery and small arms fire. And really, the enemy came right up to the wire, and we were able to hold them off, and we were able to survive the night and win the night. But we lost some, uh, we lost some of our soldiers that night, and uh, we retrieved several of the enemy dead as well. And the unique thing about that for me, I'll never forget, they brought me a soldier who had been hit with shrapnel in the mouth and jaw. And he was really having trouble breathing because it was uh, his teeth and his tongue and everything was uh, lacerated with this artillery fragment. And he just couldn't get air in and out of his lungs. And I had to go ahead and do uh, an operation called a tracheotomy. It's making a little slit in the front portion of the neck and putting an airway tube directly in to the trachea and bypassing the area of the injury. And things were quite intense at that time. And I remember that the only light I had was a flashlight. And the uh, commander of the unit said, Doc, use the red filter on it because we don't want any bright light here to, uh, to give away our position to the enemy. So with the medics helping me and a red light, I was able to get this airway tube in, and we were able to evacuate this kid. And I always wondered just what happened to him, but I didn't never got a follow up. And that that was our first encounter with the enemy. Well, and and uh, we're talking to Dr. Samuel Kalouche, who was an army captain, surgeon um, in Vietnam. We're talking that period of. Uh, 
1967, 68 uh, primarily. Uh, Dak, as you mentioned, he was a kid. You were an old man comparatively, you know, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> you, yeah. They're, they're, these are 19 and 20 year olds um, that you are providing uh, medical services for. Um, and somebody who's been through college and into medical school, you got a few years on them. Um, it, it must have been a sort of a, a soul-shaking experience to see the, the carnage among these young kids. Well, you know, a lot of feelings, uh, a lot of different feelings were, uh, were going through our minds at that time uh, over this experience. This was something that none of us in the unit uh, had experienced until we got to Vietnam. And I really wasn't that much older than some of these fellows. I was 25 years old at the time. These troopers were 18, 19, 20 years old. And the officers were a bit older than I was. Uh, But it it was trauma that none of us had ever really seen before. It was the anxiety of not knowing how long this encounter was going to last. It was not knowing how many enemy troops were out there. But you knew that people were trying to kill each other. And, you know, I can remember thinking this is a heck of a way to settle our foreign policy, uh, shooting back and forth. But we had a mission. We had a commander. We were a family. Uh, it was a small unit. Uh, and we knew we had to take care of each other. So you pretty much react according to the training you've had in that kind of situation and you and you somehow get through it well and i suspect you had to rely and did rely heavily on the medics who had even less medical not less everybody had less medical training than you but they had very little medical training from the vietnam medics i've talked to uh, over time and that had to be a little bit of a surprise too in terms of sort of the nature of that support well I can remember when I when they flew me in uh, the first day in the field, and uh, the, I was replacing another battalion surgeon who happened to be uh, who happened to go to school at Ohio State. Believe it or not, he was a Buckeye. Oh, geez. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I hopped off the helicopter and I asked him if he would stick around for a day or two to orient me because I said I, I really don't know anything about this kind of duty or this kind of medicine. I mean, I'm just coming out of an internship. And he looked at me as he put his foot up on a helicopter. He said, listen, the medics will teach you everything you know. I'm out of here. So (laughs) I'll never forget. He got on that helicopter (laughs) and I went to the medics and they they did teach me a lot about uh, getting oriented oriented to a uh, war environment. Well, and again, these these are guys who did not have a great deal of training themselves, but a whole lot of heart uh, from everything I've uh, read and talked to, and and uh, suspect that was your experience as well. Yeah, you learn quickly. You learn very, very quickly, but you're right. Uh, none of us had that previous experience. We, we talked about that first firefight, and, and when we were communicating earlier, you said, hey, I was in a lot of firefights. And I said, well, I'm going to ask you about the most ferocious firefight. Which, which one sticks out in your mind even all these decades later where you thought, oh boy, this this thing might go the wrong way? Well, I think the one uh, where I had the most anxiety is where the lieutenant colonel he came to me and he said, Doc, our sister unit is getting, uh, getting pounded over here a few uh, kilometers away and their doctor got killed. Can you go over there with some medics and uh, provide the uh, care that they need? I wasn't excited about that, but of course, you just, like I said, you just react. You you get on the helicopter and you go over there, and they had a terrible firefight going on, but they, they were able to get us into it. And they brought me their commander, who was mortally wounded. He, uh, and that's not good when the unit loses its commander. It's the lieutenant colonel. I tried to save him, but he, he, uh, he died uh, on the battlefield. And we, uh, fought off these uh, Vietnamese, these uh, North Vietnamese, and uh, the battle ended. And it was kind of late at night at that point. It was 10 or 11 o'clock at night. And I thought, oh, my God, I've got to march back through the jungle at night with my medics. I said, we're never going to make it. Well, 
a miracle happened in that they brought a helicopter for me and my medics. And I was a little reluctant to get on it because everybody else had to march home. But they said, no, you came from a different unit, and we appreciate that you came here with your medics, and uh, we have one ride out, and we want you to take it. So that was where I, I think I had more anxiety during that particular encounter than anything else because I was so fearful of having to march in the jungle at night. <laughs> right. What what month would that have been? Do you remember, Doc? That was in December of 67. In, what, in that first firefight, what month would that have been? That was in November, early November of 67. So in the one month time, you go from your first to, to your most ferocious. Um, yeah. It really, really got to be aging you uh, as you're going through this process, isn't it? I felt the gray hairs coming in, I'll tell you that. It, it was... Uh, the you always had the anxiety anyway. Every day there was the anxiety that there were these isolated snipers out there uh, taking pot shots at us. But these battles were another thing. You just never saw the enemy. All you saw was uh, people getting hit and the artillery coming in, the mortars coming in. So it, it definitely had a level of excitement that I had never really been used to. Well, let's uh, also help folks who maybe uh, don't didn't live through this and maybe haven't heard this. Um, there, there were the, the Vietnamese were um, snipers and others were focused on medics and doctors and first lieutenants. They kind of knew who to take out, commanders to to demoralize the troops and and try to break the back of that particular unit or platoon, didn't they? They did. They looked for targets like that. So the officers in the unit did not wear their uh, officers' uh, bars, and uh, we didn't wear any Red Cross uh, or medical uh, insignia on our uniforms or helmets just for that reason, that if you wore anything to identify you as an officer or as a, uh, as a medical personnel, you, you would become a, a special target. I do know the medics had a horrible um, death rate in in Vietnam. Uh, I guess I've never asked a a, a doctor who was over there what the fatality rate was. Uh, Do you guys fare a little better than the medics? Uh, The doctors, uh, I would say the mortality rate, if you took all the doctors that, that got killed over in Vietnam, is probably around 10%. It's a little bit less than the average combat soldier. Wow, still a high number. Uh, I knew I only knew one. It was uh, from another unit that got killed. So we've talked about something that happened in November of '67, that first fight, and that December of '67, that ferocious, hey, flying because their doctor's been killed, uh, fight. Uh, but you had another event in February of 1968. That's uh, noteworthy enough that the uh, Army made notice of it, and you were awarded the Silver Star, which is highly unusual. Tell us about uh, that particular uh, engagement. Well, we went out in in a full battalion sweep, and that was just after the Tut Offensive broke loose all over the country. So we knew everywhere, and we knew they were on a military mission. So we, we got our unit together, the battalion together, the colonel and the, all the officers, myself, the medics, and we started this, we went on this sweep in a fairly populated area. Actually, it wasn't so much the jungle. It was pretty close to Saigon. And uh, I remember crossing a creek, and as soon as we crossed the creek, we heard a few pot shots and some of the lead elements in our unit uh, got hit, and we thought it was either a sniper or an ambush. Well, it turned out to be an ambush. But before we knew that, you know, as soon as a soldier gets hit, we hear the cry, medic, medic, a very loud cry, medic, medic. So there, I got up with several of the medics, and we literally ran forward. Well, this was the sign for the ambush to occur. And uh, we, as soon as we turned a corner, uh, the full force of the North Vietnamese regiment hit us. And I don't, I, I really don't know how I quite survived that because there were people going down all around me and there were shells coming in behind us. 
but somehow somehow we we got through that and then the battle lasted several hours and we were tending to the wounded as best we could um but we finally won the day in large part thanks to the uh, air power that we had thank goodness we had the air force and the army gunships to help us out uh, so we turned the tide of the battle and um at the end of the battle, the uh, commanding general came down with his staff. I remember he landed with two or three helicopters. And he passed out several awards to the uh, soldiers who had participated in that particular ambush, that firefight. And I was I was asked to receive the uh, Silver Star on the battlefield at that time. You you make this sound like it was just another day at the office, and you and I both know, Sam, it was not. Yeah. It it was a very uh, uh, eventful day uh, that I'll never forget. In fact, one of the things that happened is, the, you know, the general came down and made the awards, and this was about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, still plenty of daylight. And then the general left. And the colonel came to us and said, I got some bad news. He said, we're missing some of our men. He said, and you know, we never leave anybody behind, dead or alive. He said, we're going back in there to get these boys. And I thought, oh, boy, I don't want to go back in there. I said, that's just nothing but enemy troops back there. But, you know, uh, you just you just react and you just do what uh, the colonel asked you to do, and we went back in and we retrieved our dead and wounded. Uh, and we didn't encounter a firefight. We were able to do that uneventfully. But the, but the level of anxiety just never seemed to change, and it was more intense at those moments. But then the next day, we were worried we'd have to face the same thing all over again. On that eventful day in February 20th of 1968, did your uh, medical team uh, lose anybody in that fight? We did not. I was fortunate we didn't lose any of our medics uh, at that time. And, and again, it's, it's one of those things where I, I suspect you're going, it just like going back to get the fallen troops and, and surviving that and not having a firefighter, you sort of thank God for small favors, don't you? Boy, you bet. You know, we had a chaplain with us, a priest who was from Boston. And uh, we all had religion over there, I can tell you that, and uh, attendance at the Sunday services, Sunday mass was, was uh, very high. And we... We got a lot of counseling from the chaplain. He was he was a really good uh, priest, really good with the troops. But uh, yeah, we were all prepared for the ultimate uh, sacrifice. That, that that didn't seem to be a problem. Nobody shirked from any of that kind of duty. I think people think chaplains and medics and doctors are safely behind the line and aren't aren't faced by these problems, but. My guess is that that particular chaplain, if he was good, which you say he was, at counseling and working with folks, he got his boots dirty, just like you had to get your boots dirty. Yeah, he was in the field with us. Uh, In fact, he was with us all the time. Uh, The medical people were with the unit. It was a a guerrilla type of warfare, so there were really no front lines. So... Wherever the colonel took us, we were all together. You've been married for 53 years. You've got three children. You've got six grandchildren. Are there lessons you learned, uh, Dr. Kalush, during this service period that you sort of try to pass along or, uh, or apply in your, in your subsequent uh, medical practice and year, years of kind of giving back? Well, I can can tell you one thing that Vietnam uh, did. It made me a better surgeon. There's no question about that. Uh, I had some, I had significant experience taking care of uh, trauma in the field, uh, doing, doing the surgery that was necessary. And then at the end of my tour, I did surgery at the EVAC hospital. 
And then uh, the following year, I was very busy at Fort Bragg doing surgery as well. And this military surgical experience, uh, no question in my mind, just uh, gave me uh, better skills to uh, practice ultimately my uh, open heart surgery career. So there was that direct and uh, concrete and physical uh, experience over there that helped me with, with my profession, my chosen profession. The other thing over there is, uh, you know, when we're out in the field for nine months, there's nothing to do except fight and be ready to fight. I mean, you can't really pick up and go out to dinner anywhere. You can't go out and see a movie. You can't uh, take a vacation uh, into some uh, uh, area. So you learn to live in the present. I think, boy, you know, nowadays that gets harder to do because you're always planning on some something in the future you want to do. But over there, you had to learn to live in the present. And I think that was a valuable uh, episode in, in my life. I think everybody should uh, have to go through that. Um, you know, after we got over there a while, we started counting the days until, until we could depart for the home, and get back home. It was called the D-Rose date, the date of estimated return from overseas <laughs> duty or something like that. And um, we really learned to appreciate home, which was our country, the United States. We just couldn't wait to get home and just hope to get home in one piece and alive. That was a, um, it was a deep yearning uh, that never left our thoughts. And, you know, in a war, you have that unique opportunity to see what I would call the best of human nature and the worst of human nature. You see the entire spectrum. And, you know, I... Uh, I don't think there's any other experience outside of war where you can see that degree of uh, complexity in the human nature. Some other things over there, you know, we were all drafted. And when you have a group of uh, people that are drafted, you learn to appreciate the differences that uh, everybody brings to the unit. We had people from all walks of life we had people of all different colors, all different cultures, but they were all Americans. And these were maybe people you wouldn't uh, see or, or do much with back in civilian life. But in the Army, being a group of draftees, which we all were, we learned to uh, appreciate each other and learn from each other. Those were invaluable list, uh, lessons that we learned over there. Um, well, I think one of the things I guess I'd, uh, as we come to the conclusion here, and we're talking to former Army Captain Sam Kalush, Dr. Kalush uh, spent a career as a uh, heart surgeon uh, after, the, after his service in Vietnam. Um, Doc, I don't know if people still ask you this, but I always kind of want to get a view of somebody who's, uh, who's been in the military and now away for a long time, and a lot has happened. Uh, what, what's your sense today about uh, military service, uh, if somebody would ask you? Well, uh, that's a good question. Uh, my own perspective on that is I thought at the time that the, that the draft was a very valuable tool that the, that the government had to bring citizens of various backgrounds together. Uh, it was for a lousy reason in the sense it was for war. But that method of... Uh, Drafting people into military service, I thought was a was a good human laboratory for uh, getting us all used to each other, learning from each other, living together. Now today's military is is very good and in many ways much more efficient and effective than we were because these are all volunteers, 
and they have their uh, attributes um, that are unique for an organization like that. I'm not sure I would change it back to a draft system. I think that would be unpopular and maybe just wouldn't go over, but there were some good things about it. And uh, I miss I miss that part of the uh, military policy. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. And, and again, there's a real value where everybody has to do something so that they all feel like they're Americans. As you said, they were drafted, they were all different, but they were all Americans. And, right. and that gave them that sense. Um, lousy, lousy reason, <laughs> war, but it did, it did result in that sense. Uh, Dr. Oh. Kalush, I really appreciate the extra time that you've provided to Veterans Radio today to give some insight what it was like to be a uh, battalion surgeon in Vietnam and uh, to talk about some of the battles that uh, you participated in. Well, you're very welcome. I'm glad uh, to have the privilege of talking to you today, Jim. Thank you very much. And I want to thank everybody for listening to Veterans Radio today. I am Jim Fawson. It's been a pleasure to be your host. I'm a veterans disability lawyer at Legal Help for Veterans, and you can reach us at 800-693-4800 or legalhelpforveterans.com on the web. You can follow Veterans Radio on Facebook and listen to its podcasts and Internet radio shows by going to veteransradio.net. And until next time, you are dismissed. If you have a VA claim denied by the Board of Veterans Appeals, contact Legal Help for Veterans at 1-800-693-4800. They're experts in handling cases before the U.S. Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims. Their number again, 1-800-693-4800. We again want to thank our national sponsors, the National Veterans Business Development Council, NVBDC.org, Eisenhower Center. VA Ann Arbor Health Care System, the Vietnam Veterans of America, Charles S. Kettles Chapter, Ann Arbor, Michigan, VFW Graf O'Hara Post 423 in Ann Arbor, and the American Legion Press Corn Post 46, also in Ann Arbor. They keep us on the air, as does your support. Go to Facebook, go to veteransradio.net, and support our efforts. And until next time, you are dismissed. Hey guys, it is Ryan. I'm not sure if you know this about me, but I'm a bit of a fun fanatic when I can. I like to work, but I like fun too. It's a thing. And now the truth is out there. I can tell you about my favorite place to have fun. Chumba Casino. They have hundreds of social casino style games to choose from with new games released each week. You can play for free anytime, anywhere and each day brings a new chance to collect daily bonuses. So join me in the fun. Sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. VTW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus.